to talk a little bit to you about alligators. And um, this is actually really important because you don't know when this is going to happen to you, but when it does, um, you really want to make sure that you're ready. And um, so these are uh, a couple of unverified facts uh, about alligators and alligator encounters. And um, I believe that you, to be prepared for something, you need to kind of go over it again and again in your mind. And I've done this. Um, number one, if an alligator is chasing you, you don't want to walk, in, you don't want to run, excuse me, in, in a straight line. Because they're really fast. And when they stand up, they have long legs. And they can really move fast after you. But if instead you run in a zigzag way, right? So you're over here, over here, right? What the alligator does is it's like, where am I going? And it doesn't turn very quickly, right? And so it's like, oh, over here, oh, let me turn all of me on this way, right? And so it's sort of like, you know, the race car versus the bus, right? So um, run in a zigzag line. Um, if, an, if you're in alligator territory, always bring a rubber band. And I meant to wear one, but you know, but I didn't. Um, but a rubber band is really helpful. Um, awesome. Yeah, Baldwin had an adapter. Oh wow! <laughs> um, okay. Um, so anyway, so, so just just please be aware always, you know, always bring that rubber band because um, as I was told countless times uh, as a young person, um, alligators have very little vertical jaw strength. So if you are in the, you know, you're being thrown around by an alligator, right, and it's got you and you're, you know, like, if, if only it would stop biting me, all you do is you hold it down, put that rubber band, because if you have it on your arm, you can just take it and put it around, and then it can't open its mouth, which is half the battle. It's not the whole battle, but it's half the battle, because their tails are really strong, too. So if you think, like, oh, it just was not biting me, no, because it can, like, hit you with its tail and knock you over, and that's really dangerous, too. Um, number three, something that I was told, um, is that an alligator, if the alligator thinks you're dead, it'll bring you to the bottom of the river and stow you in its den, you know? And so, um, you know, I was thinking about it, and if I forgot my rubber band, what I might do is just mm, go limp, and if it brought me to the den, maybe I could swim up, you know? Um, so, um, before I tell you the story about how an alligator ate my dog, maybe, um, I want to talk more about this piece, and, and more specifically, I want to talk about um, how I see it fitting into the idea of the contemporary. Um, when Chris spoke about this show, he was talking about it in terms of the contemporary, what it means to be part of the contemporary. And, um, and I want to kind of talk about this piece and how I see it fitting in, um, specifically the elements of vulnerability, uh, temporality and participation. I think that those are the three key elements that that um, fit clearly into a contemporary version of, of how an art museum might think about work versus maybe perhaps a more traditional one. Um, and I'm going to contextualize these examples in terms of my work uh, and, to, and my past work. Um, so I'll start with the idea of vulnerability. Um, the story of this piece is, is in a way, about a physical vulnerability. The story is, uh, if, you, if you haven't read it, the story is about um, my grandfather's wife. When my grandfather was 80 years old, he actually got remarried. And he married this woman named Helen. And um, Helen, before she moved into my grandfather's house, she lived out on a trailer and um, right that back right up to the bayou. And so she was living out there, and what she would do <coughs> is that she would actually go out there and um, and and she would uh, throw marshmallows to the alligators, and 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 she would name them. And so she would call out their names. She would say, Henry, Henry, come get your marshmallow. And Henry would come up, and she would toss it out, and then he would. <laughs> jump out and, and get it, right? And um, she's a pretty small woman. Um, she, it was, a, it was a little bit of Robin in the cradle. She was in her 70s. Um, <laughs> and so, and so this idea of Helen out there with this, all these alligators, and she's the one with the bag of marshmallows. And I mean, I know you've seen these, these pictures, and I, you know, you know, 
the trailer. Like, you know, I can imagine that, that you know, when pressed, an alligator could get into a trailer. Um, <clears throat> You know, just from my prior knowledge, which we've already gone over, I, I think it's impossible. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, uh, and some pictures that I saw on the internet when I was making these pieces. <laughs> All right, so, so, you know, I thought about Helena and why would she do this, right? But I would also think that living way out there um, on the bayou in her trailer, that I also think that she might have felt a little bit lonely. She, had, um, her husband had, had passed away, her children all lived further away from her, uh, and, and, and really she um, certainly was fulfilled by her, her oil painting, which she, she does, and, um, but there was nobody that expected her or waited for her or, you know, depended on her. And so, in a way, these alligators started to really get pumped when they saw her come down with her bag of marshmallows. You know, and and so I start to think about about that as as this unifying feature of, of, of between being wanted, needed, and recorded, and thinking about the similarities between how we function sort of every day in this world of surveillance. Um, if you've read any of the information on the Jenny Cam, um, this woman who was, was one of the first people who kind of set up this live camera in her dorm room. And people could, you know, go and watch her at any point, no matter what she was doing. And and the Jenny Cam was really interesting because she was actually in control of this very voyeuristic activity. And 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 there was sort of this moment where, as much as, as the viewers were all sort of participating in voyeurism, she was the one defining the boundaries. Um, but it's a complicated relationship. Uh, there's the ability to be sort of captured and misused, or by the alligator eaten. Um, there's the vulnerability um, in, in the sense of, of not knowing where the uh, where you're being watched from or how you're being watched. Um, and so, so when I was thinking about these two things, it made sense to me to make a parallel between the alligators and, and this idea of surveillance or watching. Um, so this first idea about vulnerability comes into the piece and it comes into my past work as well. Um, so I was thinking not just about this sort of uh, physical vulnerability, which certainly uh, exists. The physical vulnerability that I, that I see out here, these pieces are out in the, um, you know, out in the weather. And, um, you know, I keep watching the hurricane. I always watch hurricanes. I, I, I'm still trained to be kind of on hurricane watch, even though we're not sort of in the path of it um, from growing up in Louisiana. And so I watch the hurricane, but my new thought is, wow, if it hits North Carolina, I wonder how, how long it's going to take to get here, and then what's going to happen to the alligators? I mean, I started to think of them as vulnerable in a whole new way, you know? Yes, I'm still concerned for my family. I'm still concerned for the people on the coast, but I'm now worried about my alligators out here. <laughs> And so that's in a sense of vulnerability. Um, the vulnerability that they are going to change. Usually when we make a piece of artwork, when we see a piece of artwork, we sort of envision that, um, you know, that it is as it is and, and we can always come back and see it later. But with these guys, if you come back and see it later, one, either the uh, Florida Gator fans may have destroyed it, possibility. Uh, the hurricane might have somehow made it over here. Less of a possibility, but still possible. Um, so there's that element of being out in a condition uh, and, 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 and sort of the possibility of, of destruction from natural forces, uh, supernatural in the sense of the gator fans. They kind of pull something in. Um, so, so I want to um, just talk about some past work here and talk about that the role of vulnerability. Um, so I want to talk about this idea of, of, of physical vulnerability. Um, so, so this is a piece that um, that I did is quite a bit older. It's in 2005, and it's called Last Night, and it was a site-specific piece for the Skulturenhus, which is in Stockholm, Sweden. And I wanted just to say something about that. That this is um, 
This is actually the this very location that you see is the where is the warehouse where they actually where um, Alfred Nobel created dynamite. Um, that seems like a really impressive um, kind of uh, point to me. And they've made it into an art center, which is a really beautiful art center. Um, and and when I got there, I had anticipated making this piece uh, in you know uh, on site in the, in the actual sculpture's house. Uh, in the actual that, um, uh, building. And, and what was really true, so, so what this is, is this, these clay pillows that are filled with a variety of things. Some have um, these feathers in them, some are filled with seeds, some are filled with a variety of things. And so the idea here is that they're stacked on top of each other and then um, they, they almost look like velvet. And as the uh, show progresses, they sl slowly in a way break down. And um, so they start in this very pristine, beautiful, and as people touch them, because inevitably they look like velvet, so people come up and they're like, oh, and it's still kind of wet, and so like by the end it looks like, mm, like you start to see the evidence of people poking around. Um, and so, but what was really interesting to me um, about the next slide is that, um, it, it is that it wasn't just that building, right? All around the, the, the area, all around the area, there were all of these tunnels, there was all of this evidence, there was all of this stuff that talked about, you know, the creation of dynamite. And, um, and so that stuff, however, had been sort of completely uh, left to, to pot, and they had tons of, um, uh, tons of graffiti, um, you know, they'd have like a random sign somewhere leading to an abandoned um, kind of uh, old post building. Um, and then also, I mean, of course it's in Sweden, so everything is lined by these docks and by these boats. And so what I was thinking about when, once I got there, I was like, you know, it's not, it's not just about this building, but I really want to sort of like pull outside to this outside, you know, because the inside ones are vulnerable, and I like that vulnerability because people are poking them. But the ones outside would be truly vulnerable, right? Because this stuff is truly vulnerable. Everything inside is really well preserved and beautiful. Out here, it's been spray painted, even though this is a historical site. So that's true vulnerability. And so I moved, I moved them outside all along all of the sites, and um, and and that was a really uh, exciting part because it wasn't just that people who wouldn't normally go into the art center would encounter them. But then I had some ducks that actually roosted on here. This one just happened to be the one with seeds in it. So that duck was like, I'm going to get to the center. You know, and so it looked quite a bit different after he had his way with it. Um, one of our grad students saw the show here and came in and said, dude, a dog just pee on your work. And I was like, it's not the first time. And he said, probably not going to be the last time. And I didn't know what that meant, but I kind of saw it as a as an ex, uh, extension of the issue of vulnerability. I wasn't sure if he had something planned or what, but um, so anyway, so the idea of pulling people out and moving them along along the way, but also sort of showing this vulnerability. Interestingly enough, the ones inside ended up being quite a bit more poked and, and molested. And besides the duck and the dog, you know, these ended up being quite preserved. People saw them and were like, this is so interesting and strange, I don't want to touch it. Um, whereas in the inside they said, it is art, I just want to know what it's made of, poke. Um, <laughs> so, um, if we go to the next slide. Um, this, isn't the, this is actually not the first alligator, the alligator that I made, and I, I wanted to talk about this one. Um, this one was an interesting one. Um, it was done in this Nelson Road um, conservation area. And um, in the Nelson Road Conservation Area, was, uh, I, I worked with the collective and we each um, made work for this area and then there was an art tour. And um, what was interesting about it is that I immediately just um, was really attracted to the small pond. And, um, and so when I made the piece, I made it in, in, in that pond. Um, I want to tell you a little bit of a story about growing up on this river because um, it's really important for this piece. and, stuff, and uh, what happened was my, my stepfather was, had always this dream of a boat, and he loved boats, right? And he was always like, oh, I'm going to raise my children right. I'm going to get a boat, and we're going to drive around, and it's going to be so beautiful. And that's kind of his romantic view. So he'd always buy these boats, but he also 
has a strong aversion to spending money. And so when he <laughs> bought these boats, he was always getting a deal, you know? Um, and, and so so the first one was sort of this rowboat, he brings it out and, and, and we tie it up to the dock, and not a week later it sank. So it's, you know, there's the rope going straight down and, and the boat's gone and you know just under there, but still tethered tight. And so a couple of years later he's like Oh, this time I'm we're moving up, guys. I'm going to get a better boat. And so he gets a slightly larger boat, right? Gets it out there. You know, within a month, the thing sinks. And so, and, and it starts to be kind of, is this, you know, is this an act of God? Is it an act of, you know, vandalism? What's going on here? And so the last one, he's like, this time we're getting a motorboat, right? And so he gets his boat. He's like, and I'm going to teach everyone how to ski. You know, and so he, we get out there, and the first time we go to ski, he's like, watch this, kids. He's back there, and, and he motions for us to, you know, full throttle ahead, and, and he immediately is like, whoa, and he completely pulled his back. And so we're stuck out there with our dad on the end of a rope, you know, and we can't get him in the, we're kids, we can't get him in the boat, you know, and so we're sort of just, and so he's like, tug me home. Right? <laughs> And so, um, so uh, you know, one of the aspects about this piece that I think is really interesting too is that I had to, because it sat up so high rather than low, I actually um, had to make it sort of in waders, you know, treading water. And so um, the whole thing turned into sort of a performance piece in, in a sense. Um, the other interesting thing is, is it was made in 2005 and it was started actually before uh, Hurricane Katrina um, hit, and then, and then in the middle of Hurricane Katrina, um, the, this, uh, the show was up, and so there was a lot of really strange press up about that. Um, you know, for me, of course, I was like, did I make this happen? Of course not. That's just you know egocentric. But um, but there was this sort of incredible similarity about about being sort of used to the water, but sort of oddly trapped and stranded. Um, on top of, of the piece itself. Um, so if we go to the next one. Um, so, um, I'm sorry, I, I meant, not mean, can you go back and then, uh, one more thing to say. Um, so, so this is this, this is when it was just finished, but then by the end it was sort of like, it had been um, washed over and it sat for three months in this water, and so it had been, so it, I mean, it sort of became like soap when you rub soap away. You know, and so in a sense it was sort of this smaller rubbed down version of itself and in a way it sort of started to feel and look more realistic as it stood out there longer. But I didn't know that. I mean, in a sense the vulnerability of this piece is not knowing if the piece is going to get flipped over, if the piece is going to, um, you know, what's going to happen to this piece that's going to sort of adjust or, or change the perception of it. So that sense of vulnerability is one that, that um, uh, from a natural standpoint that this piece certainly demonstrated. Um, so the next slide. Um, the other, so, so um, just 
you know, more issues of vulnerability. Um, I also think about the, the issues of vulnerability within objects. And so, um, so within objects, um, this, this piece really talked about the vulnerability. This is a piece that was done, it's a site-specific installation from the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver. And um, they were building a new building and, and what they wanted was, they, they wanted to pull people sort of from one site to the other. And it was this very pristine, beautiful walk. Um, you can see it's pristine on the other side. But they had just this one ugly tunnel that went, you know, that was in, in the middle of these two sites. And I was like, I want the ugly tunnel. Give me the ugly tunnel. And, and so um, one thing about this tunnel is that it was, um, you know, um, a railroad went over it, and behind here was actually somewhere where, where a lot of people were living. So um, a lot of people who, who did not have homes, these were their homes, and so they'd have all of these objects. And, and at first when you went, you're like, oh, wow, this is really dirty. There's a bunch of debris here. There's a bunch of, you know, this is just a trash site. But because it took me quite a while to reconstruct, let me just tell you what it is. You see right here, these light casings, they have light casings all along um, the tunnel. And so I recreated a light casing, but made sort of a curios cabinet. Uh, instead of lining them up sort of straight and nice on, on the, um, uh, in the, in the cabinet, I wanted them to be really piled in there. Um, I wanted them to be things that seemed precious. And so, um, so this chinaware seemed, seemed really perfect. So I cast all this chinaware and, um, and as it's sitting in there, um, so, so as I'm making this, and it took quite a while to kind of install and get, get up there, I started to notice that the stuff underneath here it wasn't actually debris, but it was actually really well organized, um, re really well organized stuff that, that each night would come and be attended to, right? And so I started thinking of this idea of the assumption of debris. And I also started thinking about this idea that, that when, when owned stuff, they then are vulnerable to loss. Right? And so as soon as somebody has something to lose, they've got to protect it. And so it was very clear that there was, stuff, that there was a whole dynamic going on behind my piece that had to do with ownership, vulnerability, and protection. And, and so this piece kind of became, um, became part of that system. And, and it was really interesting because the first night that I left it up intact there, um, the whole entire area actually flooded. Um, again, I assumed I made that happen, um, but I didn't. Um, so it, it flooded, and so um, what you know, and, I, and, and so I got a call from the curator, and, and, and she said, you know, better um, head here in the morning. Your piece is probably gone, you know. And I came, and it was really interesting because the first thing that I noticed is that all the stuff that was under this bridge was like cleaned up, dried out, rearranged, you know? I mean, that person had already been back, and here's me, I got over as soon as I could, and, and I come and I check my stuff, and everything was perfectly intact. It was much dirtier, and so this is after it had filled up with water and then um, had to actually drain the water out from below, and then it just sort of started to accumulate all of, of this, um, this debris. And so I was really thinking about this element of vulnerability. Um, so that's this vulnerability from not to destruction, uh, destruction, but I also was thinking about the uh, sort of an internal vulnerability, and um, the internal vulnerability. If you go to the next slide, is is this sort of creative one? This is um, the a piece that um, I made when I first got here to Knoxville, and um, and I was really interested in this idea that um, the stuff that in the in the piece under the bridge in the tunnel. One element that happens is the stuff on the top actually start to break down the stuff on the bottom, right? So, so what I wanted to do was to create a long-term piece, and this piece is an ongoing piece, um, but I wanted to create a long-term piece that wasn't exposed necessarily to the elements, right? So it's not vulnerable in that way, but it's vulnerable to itself. So this idea of as you accumulate, you, you sort of destroy. And so with this piece, um, as the pieces accumulate, the pieces on the bottom start to break down here. Uh, it gets taller and taller. Also, you have to put them in from the top. So as it comes down, all of these start to chip and break. And so the ones on the top are fine, but as you get down here, there's a variety of ways that these are not fine. And so the accumulation itself sort of starts to destroy it. The other aspect that comes into it is, is that behind here, this is um, actually hand flocked wallpaper. And so it's very time consuming and precious. It's sort of a very uh, uh, 
kind of fine detail here. And, and as the collection continues, um, you know, as it is, you start to lose that. So you can't actually see that part of the piece. So if you saw it in the beginning, you might say, oh, there's this loss, right? But if you saw it in the end, all you see is this door filled with this sort of, you know, accumulation of, of, of crushed objects. And, um, you know, I, I don't know how long it's going to take, but I, I plan on, on, on getting it up to the top. Um, the other element of it is that you can see that there's some deep, uh, some decal work on here, and that decal work is, is you know, after thinking about natural dis uh, disasters and people who make it and go through natural disasters, that that in a way there are aesthetic changes, right? And I'm thinking specifically about flowware. Uh, if you've ever seen Japanese flowware, it's it's this decal work that looks like it's been exposed to water, so it bloats. So you can still see the pattern, but it's bloated. And, and, and I imagine that that would come from, you know, um, uh, you know from, from an environment that is, is a waterlogged or, or water-heavy environment, because that's a very water-heavy feeling. So when I made this, I actually made decals that were um, bloated, but they also were meant to mimic, um, Chris, do you mind going back to the tunnel piece? Um, so they're meant to mimic sort of this. So I basically made um, details, the same pattern as the wallpaper, but that, that, that sort of mimicked the way that this uh, dirt accumulated on these pieces. And so, um, so that being uh, a different kind of vulnerability. Um, and you can skip ahead. Um, and sort of referring to a history of vulnerability, so that, that what we like and what we understand is not that we're commemorating necessarily, but perhaps we're forever, that, our, that it's not just our mindset you know, that's, that's forever changed, but perhaps our aesthetic also forever changes. So that, that if you, for example, had been through you know, an incredible flood, that you might then have uh, you know, a set of dishes that somehow reflected uh, that accumulation of debris on objects. Um, that it would be a way of saying, like, I'm not forgetting, but I've made this in some way beautiful. Um, the next group of work is a, a group of work that um, talks about fragility of objects. And what you're seeing here actually is um, the way it's shown in two different ways. One of the ways that it's shown is um, with a video and then the objects intact. What happens is in each of these videos, um, it's uh, somebody is taking a sip of a cup and then is startled and drops it over and over again, a, a whole series of sets, and, uh, and it's actually played in reverse. And when it's played in reverse, you actually see the cups hold. And when it's played forward, you actually see the cups broken. And so, um, so it's this idea of sort of uh, thinking about the remembrance of something being fragile and then something actually being fragile. And, um, and so this is all derived from this, this what, what I would consider this line of, of vulnerability, although these are quite stable uh, in, in the form where you see them in the gallery. Please skip to the next one. Um, actually, just skip these next two. Let's just skip these. Oh, no, let's go back. I just thought of something. OK, thanks. Um, so, so this this piece this is from this video cuts from the um, from the video of it, obviously. Um, and one thing I want to point out is that you'll see all of these, and, and um, Jesse might recognize these. Um, you'll see all of these decals, and the decals are actually from the insides of uh, secure of security envelopes. And so all of the decal work on all of these pieces are taken from these different security envelopes. And um, you know, one thing I was thinking about this idea of something being fixed or unbroken. You know, uh, thinking about this, the recession and thinking about people getting all of these notices that you know um, perhaps their houses are being um, you know cars being repossessed. Um, you know, all of this sort of very traumatic, very embarrassing. Uh, very life-changing notices, and they come with these these, these sort of um, beautiful patterns on the inside. And so, making that comparison between 
that news and this idea that once that happens, we can, we can come out of this recession, we can be different people, we can recover, certainly, but it doesn't change that that actually happened. And, and so in this piece particularly, um, over and over, you see it being undone or fixed, but the pieces that you see are still sort of broken. That memory of what it is to be broken, that memory of something breaking, that sort of jarring experience, that actually doesn't go away. Uh, even if we have the illusion that we've kind of fixed this or righted this or made whole what was broken. Um, so let's see. The next, um, I think it's the next one. Um, <coughs> Scott? Um, the next image that I want to talk about and the next sort of element of the contemporary that I, that I want to talk about is this idea of temporality. Museums, I think, in their sort of traditional, and the traditional idea of a museum is certainly to display, but another element of the museum, I think, is to preserve. Um, if you think about it in a traditional sense, why we have collections is to sort of preserve, you know? And so this idea that, that uh, a contemporary art museum uh, would have a piece of work that cannot be collected or preserved, right? But there is no preservation of this. It can certainly be documented, but, um, but it's temporal. It can't, um, and, and it's not just temporal in the sense that, um, you know, if you look at um, uh, Andy Goldsworthy's work, I know we talked about this a lot, we, you look at Andy Goldsworthy's work who makes things out of leaves and such, as soon as a museum actually gets that work, the first thing they do is they lacquer that sucker up because they don't want the thing that they just spent a heck of a lot of money on deteriorating, right? So they do everything they can to actually preserve that. So, um, so, so, so you think about this idea of temporality and, and this idea that it's, it's not something that, that can be preserved and that each experience of it isn't gonna be the same. There's no sense of, uh, of, of uh, guarantee that when one person comes one week, it's going to be the same as when they came the next week. So, um, so this idea that you wouldn't be able to see it one time, right? You may have to see it many times, or you may only see one part of it, and that's a risk that I think, that, that I certainly take um, and understand that it's possible that if everybody, if, if people just saw the piece at, at, at the opening, then they didn't actually see the conclusion of it. They didn't actually, they weren't, weren't able to see that. It was actually quite disappointing when you could no longer see the video because the hair grew up so high over the eyes. Or that um, as it started to crack, you know, uh, and things started to grow out of the cracks, you know, that that's actually a more beautiful way to understand the piece itself. So that change tends to um, suddenly uh, become, become part of the, the equation of temporality. Um, so so um, this is the, what I call the putt-putt scenario. Um, uh, actually, let's go to the next slide and then usually I'm in control and I'm going back and forth and back and forth making everybody a little sick. Um, good thing Chris is in charge. Okay, so. Um, so this is the putt-putt scenario. Um, these, these animals, what I call the putt-putt scenario is that um, the pieces that, that I've made, and, and uh, in addition to these, there's been a number of other ones, but, um, but these pieces that I've made that are on site, they're really not meant to be, to, to be moved afterwards. They're really meant to be destroyed. There have been a couple of occasions where I've talked enough people into it um, to actually lift them into, into the truck and, 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 and get them in my front yard. And that's where the puppet scenario came in, in, into play. Um, so these, these pieces are really, um, you know, time-consuming pieces. And, and, and they take a lot of effort. And they take a lot of, of materials um, to, to create them. And what I like about that is that always in the back of my head, I know that all of this work is going to be only for the experience of the people right there. They'll certainly be documented, but um, that, 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 is, that I can't reuse it for another show, right? So it's sort of this, this idea that this is it. This is its life, and this is, this is exactly what's going to happen to it. I, I also imagine other uh, scenarios where people might put a lot of effort into 
making something that's going to be destroyed. And I think other cultures really embrace this. Um, the idea of these beautiful, um, uh, Day of the Dead is coming up here, and so the idea of these really beautiful, you know, bread that is going to either deteriorate or be eaten or, or, or whatnot. So, so this Mexican tradition of, of creating these beautiful breads, you know, you certainly think about the um, Tibetan monks and the sand drawings, um, that being a very temporal. Um, but then I also think of these people who are like, you know what I need? I need to make sure no one comes in my yard. And so I'm going to create these alligators with surveillance eyes, and they're going to catch these people. Right? And so the other, the other scenario that I start to think of is like religious devotion, maybe, or insanity. And, um, and I like to just, you know, kind of figure out kind of where I sit, and, and, um, or art. Um, but, but I, you know, that idea of why somebody might put a lot of effort into something that um, can quite, you know, will not survive and could be destroyed. Um, the puppet scenario is, is when I actually did get these into my yard, and when I got them into my yard, I got a ticket from the city of Boulder um, for having, um, you know, they accused me of, of, of trying to create like a puppet scene in my, in my yard and, and that it was a public nuisance. Um, the, I wanted to, if you could go back to the um, Chia Rabbit. Um, so this is Bobby's Chia Surveillance Rabbit, and this uh, was done in here in Knoxville up on the um, in the three flights up uh, gallery and this is actually one of the only images that I have of it um, unfortunately um, as I was making it the night that I uh, was making it my, my grandmother passed away and so I had to leave and I didn't have the chance to sort of document it or whatnot and I had planned to document it when I went to take it down and then I got this bright idea um, I got this bright idea that I would take it and I would I would take it to my front yard, right? And I would w watch it grow and monitor it and, and take pictures of it over time. And, and then I would eat the wheatgrass. I had this whole plan about it. And so luckily it was during Christmas and uh, my entire family was at my house. And as rent, the rent that I charged them is that I asked my, my father, my stepfather, my two brothers, um, and my husband to go and get it, right? <laughs> Well, it's really heavy. And so they started to get it and they made it halfway down the stairs and they're like, no, we're not, we're not gonna do this, right? This isn't gonna happen, it's too heavy, it's too heavy. So they got it and they, and they somehow inched it out to Gay Street out here and it was when the construction was going on and they had dug up a big hole. And my brother gets this idea, he says, hey, can we put this rabbit in that hole? <laughs> and um, they said, that rabbit? said, this rabbit. And he said, put it in the hole. So they all got behind it. And there's a lot of documentation of this, of the pushing into the hole, right? But, um, but there was this sort of like beautiful, to me, there was this beautiful sort of moment of, of saying like, we can't live forever. I mean, I sort of started to think of this as uh, Bobby was my grandma's name. So I sort of started thinking about this as like, we tried, we tried, we tried to keep it alive, like we tried to preserve it, but in the end, like, there was a hole, there was the rabbit, they put the rabbit in the hole, and now it's under Gay Street forever. Um, so, so the other um, elements that I wanted to talk about, um, uh, you know, in addition to this idea that they're cre created to evolve and then eventually dissolve and then be destroyed, that there's this inherent disappointment or expectation involved in them. And, and that that's something that I'm incredibly interested in uh, and, and having uh, present in, in my work. Um, the last part is about interactivity. And the interactivity component, um, let's see, uh, one more. So um, now let's just go to the, um, the internet. <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> so the interactivity, the, where most of the interactivity, I think, that I've been working on lately is, is really seen is in my collaborative work. I'm part of a, a group, uh, I'm one of four women who have been working together um, since, I think it was 2002. Um, and, and what we do is we, we make these performance uh, and, and, and installation works. And, um, and a lot of this work is where I really uh, looked at this idea of interaction and also um, the, I the idea of, of surveillance. And so um, 
let's see, if you go to the first tab, <clears throat> I'm just going to talk about maybe two of, two of these works and run, run a little low on, on time, uh, and I wanted to talk about my dog. Um, <laughs> So, so, um, so this work is a work that was recently shown. It was called Torn Echo, um, and it was a live performance and video work that was broadcast um, via the internet, and it was projected in a real in real time uh, venues. And so there were it was projected in these uh, venues across the United States. I was actually in South Africa uh, when we were doing it, and so you know it was a really interesting idea to get all of these different components from. Uh, you know, around uh, around the world, and and then project them in all these different places around the U.S. And so, what happened in this piece is um, is we had to be live from one lo we had to be live and broadcasting to the galleries from one location um, via UStream. And so um, we chose Gunnison, Colorado, which is where one of my collaborators lives. And so she's projecting, but she's projecting herself interacting with projections from all of these different places um, uh, and, and, and pre-recorded elements. Uh, so she's interacting with elements that are not live, or not live to her. And what was really interesting about this piece is that it was exactly a mirror uh, image of what was happening in these galleries. And so all of these galleries are interacting or watching these screens where presumably liveness was happening. And so we actually just reversed that as well and had one of us interacting with pre-recorded and live elements of, um, of, of ourselves. And so, um, let's see, if you go to another, uh, um, this, this piece is a, a internet piece and um, we're not saying it, uh, it's just the image of it right here. But um, it's called domestic surveillance, and what we did was we um, proposed these couple of, of different uh, these different scenarios, and we each built them in our own locations. We used to all live together, and now uh, obviously we live separate. So, so this sort of reflects that. But what's interesting to me about this piece, and and, and when we were writing it, uh, what I really liked about it is that it presumes that we all have a similar set of. Ex uh, experiences, but not the same. And so each of these scenarios has a sink, there's a chair, there's a woman, similar dress, uh, dunning wigs, so it's obviously sort of theatrical in a sense. And, um, and, and, and yet, you're not sure as an internet viewer when you come upon this, uh, one, one of the elements about the search engine is that when you search for, for things like plumbing, you could come up with this. When you search for things like, uh, you know, uh, women in bathrooms, you might come up with this. And so what we were thinking about is particularly this idea of the internet as a curator. So the internet looks at all of these terms, right, and says, okay, you're looking for, for plumbing, you know, maybe even a, a female plumber, we're gonna put you in with this category. So you're looking for a plumber and you get this domestic surveillance. And what you see is, um, something that looks like live feed. It's not live feed, but it looks like live feed. And you see these women sort of, it, are, are, they, are they like the Jenny Cam, inviting you to view them? Are they somehow trapped in there? Is this, uh, is this something that, is, uh, that should be titillating? Is this something that should be, uh, should you be embarrassed to be on this site? Uh, or should you somehow try to protect or save the, these women? And so, um, should you report this to somebody? And so. Anywhere on that spectrum, uh, depending on who you are, you might land, land when looking at, at this site. Um, I also like that that one could encounter this site without kind of expecting um, expecting to at all. And so um, um, that idea of surveillance is really interesting. Um, so I wanted uh, so so this interactivity. The interactivity that I see in the work out here is this idea that that the viewers, the people visiting the museum, actually become, this is uh, more, more of the, uh, an installation that, that depends on this idea of surveillance. Um, so, so when you come to the museum, as you uh, encounter the piece, that you actually become folded into the piece itself. The cameras upstairs are constantly collecting images, right? And so it, it is attached to a, a recorder that's constantly uh, collecting the image. And so in a sense, you, as the viewer, become part of the piece itself. 
that can then be played back and 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 uh, and as much as we're comfortable, especially in a museum setting, in a museum setting, I mean, you know, we're being watched right now, and I, you know, I know they're going to play this one back. Um, <laughs> might be on the internet already. Um, but this idea that we come into a place and we see surveillance cameras and we say, of course there's surveillance cameras. We've got to protect what's on the wall, right? We're comfortable with this idea of surveillance in certain settings. But how does that actually change when you're not sure of the reason or where it's going to go or what's going to happen to it? How does that change when you're outdoors and you're not expecting to? What, how does it change when something's not being protected? Um, but like Helen, I, I propose that, that in a way there's something comforting about, um, about surveillance. Uh, we were talking a little bit about uh, Detector, Detective Lewis which I watch on Masterpiece Theater on Sunday nights on the PBS channel. And, and Detective, Detective Lewis, at least once a show, they're solving something because, it, you know, because they found somebody on surveillance, right? And so you're protected from something, right? Or you're caught because somebody's always watching. And so there's very much this play between feeling protected and comforted and then also feeling threatened or captured. And so I'm really interested in the way that those come together in terms of interactivity with this piece in, in, the, in the museum. Um, just quite quickly, I want to tell you about my dog. Um, as I said, I grew up on the Boga Fly River. It's in southeastern Louisiana. And, um, and as, uh, you know, so, so nobody actually verified can verify this. However, um, we had these docks, um, these geese actually, and they would they would go down the river, and, they would, and so we had a springer spaniel as well. And if you're going to get two animals, you you really kind of want to avoid this combination. <laughs> a goose and a springer spaniel is is is, is a is a bad thing. Um, it drives them crazy, and it gets them all excited in a way that you can't control. And so you can't control a goose, and you cannot control a dog when it's in the presence of a goose. So um, there's a lot of lack of control there. And so, um, so the geese would go and, and float down the, the river, right? And then the, the dog would go out and hurt them. So, you know, the, the, the uh, spinner spaniel is hurting the geese. And, um, and that's the last time we saw the dog. And everybody came up with this, a different solution, right? Um, one, one solution was that it was stolen, right? And, um, and, and, and that didn't seem very, very probable to me. It was hit by a car, right? But we, we'd, you know, we'd see the car. But, but however, um, you know, one thing that I know about Springer Spaniels is that they're really good jumpers, right? Can't jump in the water. Um, that they're fast, but not as fast as a car without swimming, or alligator swimming, right? And I also know that, um, that Springer Spaniels never carry a rubber band around their um, <laughs> So, lesson, le um, lesson, uh, we know that, uh, that uh, to, to watch out. Just to watch out. Thank you very much. <laughs>